Well, good afternoon, and uh, welcome to another one of our security seminars. Uh, our speaker today is difficult to introduce. I've, I've known him for years. I've read many of the things he's done. Uh, and he's, he's actually written and, and spoken about so many different topics, uh, the, sort of the state of computing and human consciousness, uh, religion, uh, the changing impact of uh, technology on society, and a number of other areas that are, are absolutely fascinating. And he also uh, brings this to bear on how they, security and privacy are being changed by the things we do. So um, we have a title for the talk, uh, Security, Soft Boundaries, and Oso Subtle Strategies, which uh, may or may not have bearing on the content of the talk. <laughs> uh, with, without further ado, I'd like to introduce my friend Richard Thiem. Thank you. Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm, I'm going to move out from here just because that feels like a, a huge barrier. I'll go back to it uh, to pick up some things from time to time. So forgive me for carrying notes. Uh, it's great to be here. And I'm going to tell you a little bit of my story, too, in the course of this conversation because it's relevant to what we're talking about. Uh, I started life in English literature. I taught literature at the University of Illinois in my 20s. I went back to school. Some people can't help it and keep going back and did a Master's of Divinity and became an Episcopal priest. I did that for 16 years. And I bought my son an apple, too, when he was 12 years old. And we start playing with the apple. And because I knew how literature worked, and I knew how text worked in a book, in the technology of book, and I knew how people interacted with the book, and then how in the ministry you use the technology of the word as mediated through the printing press to create community and create structures of social and cultural and emotional uh, feeling for people in which they lived unconsciously, not noticing that they were in them. So that when I interacted with that Apple II, playing a text adventure game, I mean, you guys are all in the graphic games, right? But in the golden day, uh, Infocom created text adventure games, uh, of which probably the greatest is uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Any of you played that? Thank you. And it's, it's wonderful, especially played in all green caps, blocky letters on a, uh, a small dark screen. And while I was playing that game with him, I had a little epiphany. I realized that not only was I being changed in how I thought, I was being changed in how I was. That the psychic structure that I thought of as me was being subtly altered by interacting with text through the mediating, symbol, manipulating machine called a computer. And I suddenly flashed on the fact that if everybody sat in front of one of these or began to embed them in all the structures of our lives, it would be a transformation as big as speech, writing, and the printing press. And indeed it was. So I began writing about the transformation of religious experiences and the transformation of spirituality, and the transformation of religion per se. And I'll talk about that a little bit, uh, because it's relevant to evolving ethical norms for working on computers, because you're talking about trying to think about ethics at the same time that the framework or foundation of your ethical systems, which are embedded in or rooted in those religious systems, are also in the process of fundamental transformation on their way to becoming something else for which we really do not yet have names. So, as a result of that, I wrote a piece called Computer Applications for Spirituality, the Transformation of Religious Experience. And I sent it to the foremost Episcopalian Anglican Theological Review. Predictably, I got it back with notes in the margin that said, he must be crazy. God forbid, exclamation point, and who does he think he is? So, you know you're on the right track, right, when you get that kind of response. Uh, put the thing away. There was nowhere else to publish it. No one would publish it. Uh, five years later, seven years later, I don't remember exactly, a new editor went to that same journal. I didn't change a word, I just sent it back. And I have a second letter from them saying, this is so cutting edge. This is so far seeing. And they published it to no comment whatsoever. Now, the simple truth is, I was working in church structures. The churches, all churches. I'm Excuse me. Hi, Victor. How are you? Do you like to say a few words to the television land? No. no. I'm listening to you is all I want to do. Ah. Sorry for interrupting. No problem. Uh, this is what happens when you're middle aged. You pause, you go off on a cul de sac, and then you return. Ah, I was talking about my essay. Uh, and uh, 
uh, how it was no longer timely because my references to moves and mushes and the kinds of AI I referenced uh, were no longer relevant. And I was about to say that all religious structures, it doesn't matter what they are or what religion, uh, are a little slow on the uptake because their structures require fixity and persistence in order to make the claims that they make. Um, I believe the Catholic Church recently apologized to Galileo. Uh, and that's 400 plus years after the fact. I, I'm, I'm not going to be able to wait that long. So in a nutshell, I left the ministry to speak and write full time about these issues and found that my insights into how religion was transforming, luckily the timing being right, the early 90s, people were just beginning to interact with computers in a way that made the social, economic, political implications of this interaction relevant to them in their lives. So I could get jobs and I could help people understand that if they didn't get with this new program, they were going to be in deep trouble. What I was fundamentally really hammering at was, to me, axiomatic. Uh, it, it was about the cultural and the social and the psychological framework in which we habitually live without thinking about it. The unconscious presuppositions that our cultures and our frameworks give to us. Uh, but you have to become conscious during times of radical transformation of what the context is. You have to turn the context into content. That's a theme that I'll probably repeat a few times. You have to turn the context into content in order to see it, because then it can become an object of manipulation, thought, and leverage. Whereas if you don't, it affects you, but you don't affect it in the same way. And this is why Marshall McLuhan said one of the things he meant, I think, by there is absolutely no, no inevitability to anything as long as there is a willingness to contemplate what is happening. In other words, if you're willing to step back and see the big picture and take a, a really clear look at what is going on, nothing is inevitable because it renders it all plastic and even liquid in your hands, and you can master it in significant ways. So all of our systems, our human systems, our means one way or another, built on, I believe, means of exchanging knowledge, information, and energy. And I think information and energy are essentially the same things. Information is energy that has become conscious of itself in a form that we call matter. And really, there's almost nothing else in the universe once you look at it that way. So with our systems of information, we're in a symbiotic relationship. Uh, I, I love the way Marvin Minsky uh, looked at that. Uh, he looked at the fact that uh, we are so interactively embedded in the systems that we use that we build them, and then they build us, and then we inflect them again, and then they inflect us. But he said very pre with prescience, I believe, uh, that looking ahead at what excuse me, uh, computing was going to do to the world, uh, that if you did not interact with a computer, you were essentially going to be incapable of thinking. He asked the question, what do we mean by thinking? And he said, thinking is the capacity to hold simultaneously in your mind a multiplicity of representations of reality while you sift and sort them and apply them here and there and now and again to the various experiences your senses and data of your life brings to you so you can say which of these is a good enough map for now. That's what we mean. You, have, you can't be fundamentalist or literalist about any of those representations of reality. You must hold them lightly in your mind. Where then, he asked, is thinking taking place now and where is it going to be taking place? It is going to be taking place on the web. It is going to be taking place in the net. It is going to be taking place in the matrix. Whatever you want to call the metaphorical uh, attributes that we've come to accept. Now you think nothing of doing what you're doing in front of laptops and with cell phones and broadcasting this conversation. But only 10 or 15 or 20 years ago, it was a radical confrontation with people who had been contextualized by other technologies and didn't know it. And therefore, their learning curve, unlike that of younger people, for whom it is given, uh, was very, very steep. And so Minsky concluded, anyone who is not connected to the network is literally going to be like a desktop computer on a corner table pushed into the corner of the room. They're going to be like a brain in a bottle. And obviously that was a pejorative way of saying that you better be linked up, you better be networked. Now, these